On today's episode of Mile Higher, we are joined by D.A. Mitch Morrissey. She's the adorable little girl whose murder has baffled investigators for the last 25 years. In the 90s, there would be three murders in one night wow. on a Saturday night. Do you think that really drove you to seek justice for as many families as possible? Newly released court documents show a grand jury's indicted the girl's parents, but Colorado prosecutors declined to file charges against them. People felt like if we can't can't figure out who actually murdered John Bonet. There's enough circumstantial evidence. I think there's more than that. John Bonet's parents were involved in a cover up or something that occurred. I think most prosecutors believe it's the last thing in the world you want to do is convict an innocent person of something they didn't do. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 259. And today we are joined by D.A. Mitch Morrissey, who has had a very interesting career. And we are really excited to talk to you and get into many different things here. Um, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's very nice to meet with people that are interested in this and We've talked about a lot of stuff and hopefully we yeah. get to a lot of the topics that we've already talked about. But mm -hmm. yeah, we've been chatting for the past hour or so and I wish we would just brought the microphones in because we're yeah. getting to so many good things. I yeah. just wanted to elaborate a little bit for those and obviously I'll let you in introduce yourself a little bit more. But Mitch Morrissey is the former Denver district attorney mm -hmm. um, and he worked there for many, many years, but now is in or has a company called United Data Connect that works in mm -hmm. genealogy DNA testing to help solve cold cases, specifically around ho unsolved homicides and sexual assault cases, which is very, very interesting stuff. And I mean, we talk about this stuff all the time when it comes mm -hmm. to different cases we cover here on the podcast, but why don't you give the people a little intro on yeah. just who you are and, and, and maybe, you know, how you got into, uh, specifically being a district attorney. I think that's mm -hmm. kind of a good place to start. Kind of not from the very, very beginning, but just, you know, sure. let people know who you are and why, sure. you, why oh, you got well, into this. I started in the Denver DA's office in 1983. I had, uh, I went to the University of Denver Law School. I, it was downtown at the time. So it was very interesting to work at the DA's office as a law student. I was an intern in the appellate division. So I helped with appeals. I helped with trial briefs. Uh, we would help when there was a trial going on and somebody needed research right away during a murder or something. We would do that. And Norm Early became the DA in 1983. And I was one of the first people that he hired. Um, and I'll never forget. He said, well, Mitch, what do you think you'd be doing in five years? And I said, well, Norm, you know, my dad, my dad's a defense attorney, also did some civil practice. I'll probably be working with my dad in five years. And I never got the opportunity to do that because my dad continued to practice and practiced for about 50 years and then retired. And, uh, because I never left the DA's office, mm -hmm. uh, Norm hired me. I started in the County court trying DUIs and all I ever wanted to be was a trial lawyer. And I realized that this is it. This is the place where you can stand up for victims. You can do all kinds of important things. If you have somebody that's wrongful, they're not supposed to be charged. You know, the nice thing about being the prosecutor, you just say, Hey, I can't prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. It's almost like having an eraser. I mean, it's like somebody thought there was enough evidence and filed the case. But now that we've looked into it closer, we don't have a case, we dismiss it. And that's the right thing to do. And it makes you feel good when you do it. But you also get to prosecute people that are responsible for some really horrendous things. The other thing that my experience, as I continued in the DA's office, and I was there for 33 years, uh, I started to get bigger and bigger cases. And then I started also to be on call for homicide. And then 
I was on call every day for 12 years when I was the elected DA for a fatal police shootings mm-hmm. where somebody gets killed by maybe an Aurora officer that came into Denver, a Denver officer, a uh, Federal Heights officer. Uh, we even had a, a, a officer down at Metro who shot a guy who hit him with a uh, samurai sword. He was dressed as a ninja. And the, oh, wow. Yeah, and, and so I covered things like that. And I don't think people really understand that you get called out. I would be on call for a week. And there was a time in the 90s where there would be three murders in one night on a Saturday night. And I would go to the scene first and make sure that the police weren't, you know, entering something without a warrant. And, you know, you really never had to do much of that because the Denver police were very professional. You'd get there sometimes because I lived in Denver and they all lived in the suburbs, I would get there before the detectives. Really? Wow. But the officers would have the scene. And they'd have secured the, it. And- they'd secure it and all of that, and they might say, hey, you want to see? And you're like, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not here I don't want to yeah. see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to wait and make sure when before we go in, we go in appropriately. Right. You know? Um, so is this when you're DA then? You were doing that as a DA? I was doing at, as a chief deputy. Okay. I was responsible to be on call. So, you know, and I don't think people understand that. So I've seen if the person was still alive, they weren't there. But if they were dead, they were there. You've seen a lot. So I've seen a lot of real bad things. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen guys that murdered their mothers, beat them to death, and their mother was there in a nightgown. Between the beds, dead. Wow. I've seen guys that were shot in the head and, you know, parts of their skull are all over a small room in Capitol Hill. I, I've seen a lot of things that I don't think people uh, realize that prosecutors actually do see those kinds mm-hmm. of things. And I often asked, well, how do you deal with that? And it's like, well, my job was to go and to help and to assist. And then we would go down if there was a suspect, make sure that their rights were protected, make sure that um, the videotape that was being done, if there was gonna be a confession, that it was done. And I would sit in the room and I would help the detectives question the suspect, important witnesses, things like that. And you know, I remember distinctly cases where You know, the detective is honing in on, did you kill this person? You know, getting that that ID Mm -hmm. element. And I'm sitting there understanding felony murder. This was a rape of a young girl. Um, Did you have an involvement in the rape? Well, the other guy raped her. Did you hold her? Yeah, I had a hold of her arm. I was holding down her arm while he was raping her. I don't have any more questions. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because if he is involved in the rape and she gets murdered, first degree murder. And so sometimes it was important to have us there for those kind of dimensions that maybe a new detective would be missing. Right. And they would always defer to us and say, Mitch, you have any more questions? Now, I got to tell you, sometimes those nights where there were three and I'd worked all day yeah. at about four in the morning when they turn and say, Hey Mitch, do you have any questions? I was fighting off falling asleep. Mm-hmm. There were times where I remember distinctly, uh, no, I, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, it was a tough job. It was a great job. I got to do what I wanted to do as far as, uh, try cases. And that's all I ever really wanted to do. And then Colorado passed these term limits. And my boss, who was then Bill Ritter at the time and became governor of the state of Colorado, he's term limited. And so really for me, the dilemma was, do I stay here and work for somebody else that's probably going to be a politician that probably doesn't understand kind of the, the way that we have built this office over the last 30, 40 years, or do I run for this? And I ran for DA. I got elected in 2004. 
Denver only has Democrats. So I won the primary and I never had another opponent. Wow. And I don't know if that's because I was doing such a good job that people didn't want to run against me, but I wasn't popular with the Democrats. I came in third at their county convention, but the people of Denver signed my petitions, got me on the ballot, and I got elected, and I won by about 12% of the vote with, in a three-way race. So I'm coming from third, and I win by 12 points. Wow. And I then became the DA, and there was kind of this shock because now I wasn't in the courtroom anymore. I was sitting behind a desk running this 300-person office, and 70 or more of them were lawyers. And I don't know if you've ever tried to manage lawyers or trial lawyers, but they all think they know better than you do Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. how to do things, about how to run things. But the key was I had been there for 20 years at that point. I knew what we were good at. I knew what we needed to improve. I knew, I knew the players. I knew who, so, you know, I was able to make adjustments strengthen the office, make it a better place. I knew what Denver needed as far as, for instance, the crime lab. Mm -hmm. We had a incredible group of people that did our forensics for Denver. In the sixth floor, they had about half of the in police headquarters down on Cherokee Street. And it was people in closets with PhDs, that kind of thing. So we put it on a ballot initiative and we built a state-of-the-art crime lab. And I ran the campaign to do that. You know, when you're not opposed, you know, don't run or run unopposed is mm-hmm. the best way to do it when you're, when you're doing this. I was able to run a couple of different issue kind of campaigns. And we got this beautiful crime lab built down on 14th and Cherokee. And it's, I think, one of the best prettiest buildings yeah, it looks amazing. in the state, in the state, certainly in Denver, it's in the golden triangle, which is important because that's where the courthouse is. Right. And that's where the evidence that they test is. And the buildings are connected underground so they can go and get evidence from the old police oh, headquarters, wow. take it over to the crime lab, never carry it out on the street. So you, know, you don't you, have to, any of that coming, funny yeah. business yeah. coming in. Yeah. If you got a pound yeah. of cocaine that you're taking across the courtyard, who knows right. what's going to happen, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, it yeah, could yeah. be a problem. So, you know, it's connected to the criminal justice system. And it, the people in that place just do this incredible work. Um, you know, everything from fingerprints to DNA. And I used to tell people, listen, I am the luckiest prosecutor in the state, in the United States. I would, I did hundreds of presentations about DNA around the world. And I'd say, I ride an elevator down a few floors. I walk a block and a half. I ride an elevator up a few floors and I'm in the best crime lab in the world. Yeah, that's amazing. I helped them build it and I'm really proud of it. And a good friend of mine still runs it to this day, Greg LeBerge. He's an incredible DNA analyst. Uh, Now he runs the lab and the culture of that place like the culture that we kept going in the DA's office, I think really served the people of Denver well. Have you ever wondered why laundry detergent comes in massive plastic jugs? Who wants that? 91% of those inconvenient, awkward, heavy jugs end up in landfills and oceans, harming our planet and marine life. There has to be a better way. And it's not like you can just stop doing laundry, right? So do what I did and switch to Earth Breeze. My new EarthBreeze laundry detergent eco sheets look like dryer sheets, but they're not. It's a revolutionary liquidless laundry detergent that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. No measuring, no mess, and no heavy plastic jugs. Just toss the sheet in. EarthBreeze has really made the whole concept of detergent better. The packaging is lightweight, biodegradable, and plastic free. Fits in any drawer that you have. Great for all laundry styles, even sensitive skin. Their eco sheets are hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested. EarthBreeze is compatible with high efficiency washers, gray water systems, and is septic safe. They offer flexible subscriptions that can be adjusted, paused, or canceled by you at any time with no contracts or fees. And they're delivered right to your door via carbon neutral shipping at a frequency that you can set that works for your unique lifestyle. Most importantly, you can still get a powerful clean. EarthBreeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and your clothes come out clean 
every single time. I'll never go back to traditional detergent, but with Earth Breeze, I don't need anything extra except for the Earth Breeze sheet. Throw it into the washer, it dissolves, and it has your clothes smelling fresh. It just makes it so much easier. There's no mess. You know, oftentimes I'd spill the detergent all over and it just gets all grimy and sticky. Well, you don't have to worry about that with Earth Breeze. Don't just take my word for it. You can try it for yourself with their risk free 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, Earth Breeze will give you a full refund, no questions asked, and no return necessary. That tells you a lot about Earth Breeze as a company and how they really stand behind their product and its efficiency. Switch from the old fashioned goo to something new. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash milehire to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash milehire for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash milehire. So in your time when you were a deputy and you've, you were firsthand seeing what these families were going through in those moments, do you think that really drove you to want to seek justice for as many families as possible? Do you think those moments early on are what really fired you up for the rest of your career? Well, I came in under Norm Early, who if you read about Norm Early and if you read about him in my book, or if you know anything about Norm, he was the first non-white male. He was a male, but he was African-American. And his whole thing was about the victims movement. Mm -hmm. And he was the first DA of all the DAs that of Denver, which I wrote a whole book on all of them. So I know what they were about. He was about victims of crime and, uh, recently was named a fellow for the common sense Institute. And they wanted to name it after a former governor. I said, we need to name it after Norm Early. Mm -hmm. And his son said, yes, Norm had passed away this last year. And, but that Norm cared about victims. And Norm was part of the victim movement that started. And just give you an example, in Denver, in domestic violence, the rule used to be you showed up and a man was beating his wife and the Denver police would say, ah, take a walk around the block. Wow. Yeah. And they would leave. Yep. And then when they came back, the woman would be dead. Right. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what it was like to be the victim of domestic violence in Denver mm -hmm. back before Norm Early. And then Norm started to change things. And we started, you know, there was this movement and it was, a, it was in Colorado and Colorado passed the Victim Rights Amendment to the, to the state constitution. And then the National Victims Movement started. Uh, Crimes Against Women's Act was passed. And there was a lot of money available then to do things for victims. Uh, COVA, which is the Colorado Organization for Victims of Crime in Colorado, started up, run by Nancy Lewis, an incredible person who just retired recently. Um, and so I got to be part of all that. And I was young. I'm not young anymore, but <laughs> I was young then. And it really had an impression on me. Yeah. But the other thing that that made prosecutors do was sit down with victims mm -hmm. and talk to families. Mm -hmm. and make sure their rights were their rights were respected in court there were judges in denver when i started that you would say judge the victim's the victim's father he's lost his daughter in a murder he's stuck in traffic he's 5 minutes late i don't care let's go ahead oh my god and they would do the sentencing without him well, that's a violation of the victim's rights amendment now. And that hopefully doesn't happen anymore. And I was part of that. And so I got to sit down with victims and, you know, we'd go up to the Capitol when I was the DA and we were pushing bills and things like that with victims that I knew were going to be compelling and tell the story of what it was like to look over your shoulder for 10, 15 years waiting for the guy to come back like he threatened he would mm -hmm. when he beat and rape you, raped you. And I know those people and they've made a big difference in my life and why I do what I do now is to try to give answers to families, families that have been waiting to hear what happened to their loved one or, you know, they're, they're, 
don't know what happened, the person they think ran away or, and we identify them and we explain what, you know, then, you know, they committed suicide, they died in an accident, but they've been a John Doe for the last 27 years. So it really what I do now and our, you know, our company is United Data Connect and our logo is we solve cold cases with DNA and genetic genealogy. And that's what we do. We do some training. If people are interested, if they're genealogists and they want to learn how to do investigative genetic genealogy, we do an intensive one week course. Uh, we do it about three times a year. It's in conjunction with the, uh, Florida International University. So they get a certificate Hmm. that say that they have graduated from our course. And so we're in the training business and the case solving business. It's interesting when people say, well, Mitch, you're retired, right? I say, no, I have a company. And they say, well, what do you do? I solve cold cases. And they just look at you like, who has a company that solves cold cases? It'd be you. You know, kind of, you know, I can tell when they look at me and it's like, yeah. who, if anybody would do this, you'd be the one. Well, I think it says a lot about you and that, you know, your passion for getting justice for these families, getting answers for them after yeah. all these years just is a high priority for you. And that's rare to see. Um, we cover cases all the time where, you know, we work directly with families and they tell us just about how awful their experiences have been with DAs or the Justice Department in general. And, and that's sad. It's and that's sad. sad. But the one thing I can tell you is that the generation of prosecutors that came into the office with me, mm-hmm. people like, and you wouldn't know any of these people because they went into private practice, but Leslie Hansen, Nate Chambers, uh, David Dansky, uh, just incredible prosecutors. But the thing that made them good was they understood protecting victims' rights. You know, and and I got to tell you, sometimes the victim's as bad a guy as the guy you're trying or worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have seen cases where my prosecutors would come back and say, you know, Mitch, that was an attempted murder, but the guy died three times at Denver Health and they saved him each time. And it would have been a better murder case than it was attempted murder. When we put him on the witness stand, he's a horrible person but they had contact with the person. They protected their rights and did the things that they needed to do. The person may not want that. I mean, I had fathers of victims that were killed that said, we don't want you to do this. You know, we don't want this to happen. You know, so victims, you take them as you find them. And so, and my hope is that at least in Denver and in Colorado, most of those victims are not having that bad experience because what brought them there, they're completely innocent. Mm -hmm. And it's not a good thing. Right. And they talk about closure. I don't think that happens. If I lost my daughter or my son and I found out that the person that did it was, I would want them to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. But the day they were held accountable I think I'd feel that loss just as much Mm -hmm. that next day as I felt it the day I lost him. And for me, that's, that's the way it is. But we, we were on the forefront on the ground level of changing the way business was done around victims in Colorado. There were people like Steve Siegel that Norm Early brought in who was an expert in victims rights and he stayed throughout and he was still working for me and we were still doing important things for victims. And the last thing I did as DA is we built a family justice center, uh, the Rose Andam center. Right. And the Rose Andam center is a place. It's a one stop place for victims of domestic violence and their children. Yeah. And they come in off buses. They come in walking, carrying their babies. And they come to this place that is warm, comfortable, beautiful, and they get all of the services that they need. So if they need shelter, the people that represent the shelter are there. They triage their situation. And, you know, Michael Hancock, Mayor Hancock helped us. And it's named after Rose Andam, who owned the McDonald's out at the airport. 
Oh, really? She gave us the first million dollars. We got wow. help from the Anschutz Foundation and their family. We got help from the Daniels Fund. And my wife, we basically raised about $13 million to, to revamp wow. this building and to get this building and to get it going. It has a clinic and Denver Health has the clinic. The cops that handle domestic violence, the detectives, they're there. The DA's there. The city attorney's there. Everything kind of can go into motion as the victim arrives there. And it's, it's not the only place in the country, but I think uh, when you talk about family violence centers, I've been in a lot of them in yeah. Minneapolis, San Antonio, uh, San Diego. I think it's the nicest one that I've been in. Um, and the work they do there is just really incredible. So I got to get the crime lab and just a few blocks down from the crime lab is the Rose Andam center. Um, it's an old building and, but it's, it's beautiful when you get inside and it, it makes a difference for victims. And that's all part of, you know, what Norm Early started, what Steve Siegel started, and it just kind of was the next step in where we needed to go in Denver to, to protect victims of domestic violence and victims of crime. Yeah, it seems like this is something that every city needs, yeah. both of those two facilities. And it, it's because in my mind, I'm like, man, if every, every city, every town across the country had a DA such as yourself who, you know, had that sort of mindset, uh, I think it would just be a totally different landscape uh, mm -hmm. across the board. Cause it's just, it seems, I mean, we've, we've done a couple cases where we've gone into small towns, especially in the South where it just is like still the wild West. It seems like down there when it comes to just how oh, they, South. how they handle things. And there's this definite divide between the DA's office and victims. And it's, it's really unfortunate to see cause it creates mistrust among other things. And uh, have you ever had a situation during your career where, perhaps you know victims were upset with you because in in my mind you know your job is to prosecute cases where you will get a conviction right and so were have there ever been cases where maybe you wanted to prosecute it but just couldn't because the evidence wasn't there and victims were upset with you yes absolutely i remember family victims uh meetings uh one some that involved my boss where you're sitting there with your boss. Um, I remember one very distinctly where the father was wearing shade. He was wearing reflective sunglasses at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and uh, he was very upset that the, his son had been killed. Mm -hmm. But um, his son was pulling this kid out of a car. Um, he was surrounded by bikers. And the kid shot his son. And the other kid in the car said, these guys were going to kill us. They were threatening to kill us. And in Colorado, you have self-defense that the prosecutor has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it's not self-defense. And there is a case where my father was defended a man up on West Colfax in the 50s where it Colorado Supreme Court recognized self-defense as a matter of law. And when you have self-defense as a matter of law and you're confronted with that, you cannot go forward. And that was the decision that I had to make in that case. Now, keep in mind that two prosecutors reviewed it before me and filed the case. And I'm in a posture where this case should have been turned down mm at the entry level, but wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was a murder case. It's hard to turn down a murder case, but you're, the rules don't change. And this father was very upset with Bill Ritter. And, you know, I was just up front with the guy. He was very combative. And I just told him how it was. He said something like, you know, my son's blood's still out there on the street. And I said, yeah, and I've seen it because I've been out there. And he was shocked, you know, but he did not leave happy. Um, he lost his son, uh, but we couldn't do anything about it. And 
the young man that killed him, I'm convinced they would have killed him. And he didn't shoot the person until they were actually physically trying to pull him through a broken window in this car. They had broken out because he had swerved, knocked over one of the biker friends. They chased him down um, and they were pulling him out of the car when he shot this guy. And, you know, a Denver jury is going to find him not guilty. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, a judge could have said at halftime, Mr. Morrissey, this is your evidence. You can leave, yeah. you know, because we didn't have a case. And it's very hard when you don't have a case to, to have to explain that to somebody that lost a loved one. Yeah. Um, they're not always rational. Um, they're not always willing to listen. But I had those experiences. And then I had experiences where I tried cases and lost. And mm-hmm. the family sat in and watched every single second. And they saw how hard we worked and how hard we fought, but we still lost. And they came afterwards and said, you know, uh, thank you for all the work you did and everything. They were just heartbroken that we didn't uh, win the trial. But they didn't, you know, it's hard to understand why a jury does what a jury does sometimes. Mm -hmm. But they never once, said anything to us about, well, you know, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't try for my son, or, because you got to remember in Colorado, the victim doesn't bring the charges. And we can bring charges when the victim says, no, I don't want to prosecute. We can still bring the charges. Uh, It's different in some other states. You have to have the, the, consent of the victim we don't right. have that we represent the people of the state of colorado so you can do it for them if they even if they refuse we can do it in spite of them okay if we need to and so there were a few times like that where you know victim was like well if you prosecute the guy i'm going to leave the state or you know and have people and what i would do then is i'd have that information i'd tell the defense that information and i would make an appropriate offer That was the other thing about the victim's rights amendment was that any plea bargain, any disposition that you did short of trial, you had to tell the family what you were doing and why you were doing it. And they didn't always agree, but they didn't always also understand what the evidence, how it was going to play out or what it was going to look like in front of the jury and what the limitations were going to be. And there were times where you know, rape victims, I had to tell them, listen, they're going to bring in the fact that you were a prostitute when you were a a juvenile. And and they're going to ask you about that kind of stuff. And I've done everything I can to keep that out. Mm -hmm. But the judge ruled against me. And they'd say, well, I don't want to go forward. And, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to go forward when somebody doesn't want to. You can, you can force them. Uh, That was the nice thing. And I know we'll get into DNA, uh, but it got to the point where with DNA, I could prosecute a case where the victim, I couldn't even find the victim. Sometimes I, the victim might be dead. Um, I remember one case where uh, all we had was the victim's panties because she'd run away. It was a sexual assault on a child. And you know, the contents of her panties indicated that this guy had had sex with her. We're able to prove what is the equivalent of statutory rape. We didn't even have the girl, but it was a mixture of her DNA and his, and we convicted him of sexual assault of, on a child. So, you know, you take your victims as you find them, you treat them with respect, and you do everything you can to make sure the system does. If you have a judge that doesn't like listening to victims, and we do it throughout the system, and you hope that even the parole board And I'm on a board right now, Joe Canada, it's voices of victims. And he goes into parole hearing with victims. He provides them with the services they need to get there. And he tries to make sure their rights are protected when they go in front of parole. When you're a victim, especially of something like a homicide, you're a victim for life. Absolutely. And even though you're innocent, 
you had nothing to do with it, for the rest of your life, you may have to show up at parole hearings. You may have to express again what happened to your daughter. That's what, that's why Joe does it because his daughter was murdered in Denver. And I know the people that tried him and he's in my book and he's made a difference. He's probably got seven or eight laws passed in the legislature. The guys don't get out as quickly. Um, they have to serve 80% of their time. If it's a violent crime, that's because of Joe Canada. And, uh, so, you know, it changes people's lives and, uh, sometimes for the better of the community, but I'm not always convinced it's for the better of the individual because these are tragic things. Yeah. And when working on these tragic cases, do you ever feel like your mental health becomes compromised? I've been asked that a lot and I never felt that it did. Um, There'd be times you'd be really tired and kind of worn out, Mm -hmm. but I always would tell the people that I would hire to have regular friends, to have uh, good hobbies and exercise and take care of themselves because you can become obsessed with this and then it will twist you. And I don't know if that's a mental health thing, but I found that at a certain stage in my career, I really didn't trust anything anybody said to me, especially if they were a defense attorney. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and you can't go through life like that. And I'd also tell them, listen, be careful uh, of your lifestyle. My father was a trial lawyer. He was a great trial lawyer. And he was an alcoholic. And I think they went hand in hand. He probably would have been an alcoholic if he'd been a garbage man. But Hmm. he relieved his pressure by drinking. Hmm. I stopped drinking when I was, been a DA for about a year or two. So, and I stopped drinking and I didn't have another drink until I was term limit. Really? Yeah, because, you know, I was prosecuting people that were driving drunk. I saw what alcohol was doing to people in the criminal justice system. I knew my dad was an alcoholic. I knew that I was kind of the common, you know, in a drinking group, I was the one that was the common in three different groups of people that would Mm -hmm. go after work Mm -hmm. and have a beer yeah, or maybe two or three or maybe too many. And I didn't want to be that. And so, you know, I don't know if it was the pressure of the job or what it was, but um, I just had to make sure that didn't happen. Now, if you talk to my kids, they'd probably tell you, well, the things we had to listen to (laughs) at the dinner table had an impact on our mental health. I bet, yeah. And neither of them decided to be lawyers, which is kind of disappointing, but they're great (laughs) kids. And, uh, you know, they they miss a great career. But, um, yeah, I have people say, well, how did you deal with seeing all the things you saw? Well, you know, if I was a surgeon and the sight of blood Mm -hmm. made me faint, then I wouldn't be a very good surgeon. And I remember the first homicide went, there was a man dead on the porch of this house. And as I was approaching, I was like, how are you going to deal with this? I got to deal with this. And, And there were homicide detectives there that, he knew I was there for the first time, been around for years and years and years and was kind of watching me. How is he going to deal with this? And you have to compartmentalize those things. And even though I was successful in doing that, there are places in my mind where those visions and those experiences are. And they're there and I think about them sometimes, but they don't uh, keep me up at night or uh, I'm sure there's some that listens to this as a psychologist or psychiatrist that probably thinks I need serious help. But, um, you know, I've just never felt that it, it had that big a negative impact on my mental health. Built for it. Yeah. I think it's some of it's in the DNA. Yeah. I agree with that. I think. My grandpa, my dad, yeah. we all did this and, you know, I'm a third generation Denver lawyer and, uh, I'm proud of it. And I thought that, okay, to be a trial lawyer in this setting, you have to deal with these things. 
Well, even the stuff they talk about and show in court too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see a lot of stuff there as well. Well, I got to tell you, there were some things I couldn't do. Um, I would be brought into these cases to do the DNA in cases where little girls were raped or uh, little girls were murdered, uh, kidnapped and raped. And the one thing I would say when the lawyer would come and say, Mitch, I have this DNA, I need you to do this case. And you've got to remember that I did all of the DNA cases in Denver, probably almost 100% of them for about a decade. You were the first one to do Well, that. lawyers yeah. don't like science and math. That's why they're lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> and so not that I liked it. It's just that I did the first case in Denver, not the first case the Denver DA's office did because that was up in Aspen, Quint- Quentin Wortham. But I did the first Denver case. And then from then on, if there was DNA in a case, uh, it was like, get Mitch. Mitch will do it. Mitch will help you. But I always would tell him, listen, I don't want to, I can't, I can't question, I cannot do the cho- the kid. And yeah. in fact, I couldn't get up and leave when these little girls would testify to what happened to them. But um, I could never question them. And I wouldn't be part of the victim meetings with them and the things that they did pre-trial. I mean, you know, I had my own side of the case to do, right. but I would stay away from uh, the crimes against kids. I yeah, just, uh, don't blame you. that was not something that I was, that I would have been good at. Um, and I had some experiences early on where I just didn't, you know, I didn't come away feeling that I improved anything for the victim. Mm or handled it the way it it needed to be handled. And I wasn't trained to do that. And the people in our domestic violence and our family violence unit were trained to do that and were very good at it. So let me do what I'm good at. You do what you're good at is the way I saw it. You know, when you could co-counsel in a murder case or, you know, I tried a serial rapist who kidnapped little girls, um, you know, let me do what I'm good at. What I'm good at is explaining to this jury through these witnesses why this guy did this. Not not why why we can show he did it. Not why he did it. Yeah. That he did it. And that's what DNA does. And that's what forensics do. And that's what I was an expert at doing. If you guys have been watching our show for a while now, you know that one of my favorite sponsors is Stitch Fix. I cannot say enough good things about this service. I've been paying for it on my own for years now, and I truly love it. I actually get the most frequent option for fixed deliveries. I want to get my boxes as often as possible. If you have not heard of Stitch Fix, let me tell you why it is so awesome. If you are someone like me who doesn't really enjoy shopping, I hate going to the mall. I hate dressing rooms, and I don't really have a great sense of fashion, to be honest. I really struggle to keep up with the trends and that's why Stitch Fix has been so crucial for me because it really cannot be easier. You can think of Stitch Fix as your style partner. Your stylist will learn your tastes and collaborate with you on looks you love and over time they get even better because they know you and what you like and what you don't like even more as time goes on. All you have to do is answer a few questions about where you typically like to shop, what you like to wear and your price range. And with your choices in mind and a wide range of sizes available, they'll find your perfect fit. And they've got you covered with over a thousand brands and styles. Really, one of my favorite parts about it, though, is you can skip the dressing room. You can try your pieces on from the comfort of your own home. And you just keep what you love and send back the rest in their prepaid mailer. So easy. Plus, shipping, returns, and exchanges are always free. And there's no subscription required. Simply order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular seasonal fixes. And if you ever want to skip one, you totally can. You're in complete control. I really can't recommend it enough. I've recommended it to tons of my own friends and family. So try Stitch Fix today at stitchfix.com slash mile higher and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash mile higher for 25% off today. Stitchfix.com slash mile higher. You had the opportunity to work on, speaking of horrific cases, one of the most infamous cases in the country, definitely in Colorado, um, the JonBenet Ramsey case. I bet that was quite an experience. Well, I have never seen 
a case with that kind of media attention. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you, though, all I did was the grand jury part of it, and all I was supposed to do was the DNA. And Bill Ritter came to me and said, Mitch, I need you to go up to Boulder and help Mike Kane out with this grand jury. And I said, Mike, I said, Bill, no, I'm not doing this. And he said, well, okay. Um, I said, well, what would you want me to do? And he said, well, you have to do the DNA. Mike doesn't understand it. Bruce Levin was being brought in also, and he didn't understand it. And it became very apparent to me that the Boulder DA's office didn't understand DNA based on when I got involved in it. And so it was like, there is no DNA. <laughs> that's how early on it was. And he said, well, yeah, that's why it's perfect. Just go up there and, yeah. you know, your assignments to do something that, and, you know, you can relax. Cause I had mm -hmm. just finished. I had just finished a death penalty case. We did not get the death penalty where within a month of the John Bonet Ramsey case, a little African American girl named Ashley Gray had been murdered down on five points. A man had taken her out of her house. She was with another little girl, John Bonet's age. He took these two little girls out the back while the father was out on the porch smoking crack cocaine. And he kidnapped these girls and the brother of one of them got the brother of the other girl got him away. And then he took Ashley down to a loading dock near Coors field and he brutally raped her, Jesus. strangled her to death and threw her in a dumpster. God. And she was found in the dumpster the next day. He went home to his girlfriend's house, handed him her his jeans and said, wash these. And she did. And we found, we found Ashley's blood on his pant leg. He was with, he was in custody within a day or so. And we tried him and we sought the death penalty on him. Jury convicted him of felony murder, sexual assault, and not deliberate murder, even though he strangled this little girl to death. And that ended our ability to go forward on the death penalty. But I spent two years working on that case every day. 12 hours a day, I would leave my house at about six in the morning. My kids would be asleep. I'd come home at eight, 10 o'clock at night. Wow. My kids would be asleep. Mm. It was the longest trial I ever had. And I never saw my kids awake for two years. So oh, I'm getting asked to do this Ramsey case. Yeah. And, uh, you're probably thinking, here we go. Yeah. Again. Here we go again. Yeah. yeah. Is it yeah. worth it? Yeah. And do, does my, wife let me do this does do my kids you know deserve this kind of thing um and so i said no and I, you know i love bill ritter he's a great guy he was a great boss i tried murder cases with him when we worked for norm early together mm -hmm. uh he was a great guy to try cases with uh some people don't like him because they don't like the way he was the governor of colorado i don't care about that stuff he's a great guy uh, but I told him no. It was the only thing I ever told him no about. Uh, but then Mike Kane, he knocks on my front door and I'm watching my two kids. And he, he says, Mitch, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, Mike. And Mike had been my first chief deputy when I started in the DA's office. And he said, Mike, and Mike is every bit as compelling as Ritter. And Mike is, again, one of my favorite people. I talk to him every now and then. Uh, he lives in Philadelphia. He lives in Pennsylvania. He said, Mitch, I need you to do this for me. Uh, I don't understand it. It's part of this case. You need to come up and help me with this. I said, okay, on one condition, I never have to talk to the media about it. I never have to talk to anybody about it. Um, and he said, absolutely. Alex Hunter will do that. We won't talk to the media we won't, you know, you don't have to do any of that. So I went and got all my hair cut off and got a pair of sunglasses and went up to the start the rent. They were starting like, you know, the next week. Wow. So it really, yeah. So I changed the way I looked, <laughs> got <laughs> sunglasses. Cognito. Yep. And I'll never forget the first day I was on the job. I had to get something out of the trunk of my car. It's completely surrounded by cameras people yelling oh things God. at me and I'm just walking, you know, my hair is about 
you know, I got it. Like a buzz cut? Buzz <laughs> yeah. off. And uh, now it didn't matter. They still knew who we were and who I was. And there was a guy that sat on a hill just outside the sidewalk that I would walk in every day with his camera. And I don't think he ever got anything worth showing, but he sat there. Sometimes he'd have four or five inches of snow on his head. Sometimes he would be sitting in the, you know, 80 degree sun. And I would say, good morning to him. How's it going? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. But other than that, I stayed clear of the media on that. Mm. But, you know, I'm brought in to do the DNA, but there's really no DNA. So the first day I go up to the Colorado Bureau of Investigations to talk to the DNA analyst. And um, about halfway through the conversation, she knows me from working in the Denver crime lab. And she says, and she knows if she says certain things to me, it's going to mean something. And what she said was, well, Mitch, her name was Kathy Dressel, and she had this high voice. She said, well, Mitch, um, what about that other stain in her panties? And I said, Kathy, I haven't been on this case long enough to read it. What are you talking about? And she said, well, there's another stain in her panties. I've tested the one, and it did have a mixture, but it didn't have much of a mixture. There's a couple of markers in there. And I said, it's a separate stain? And she said, yes. And I said, is it big enough? What's, how big is it? She showed me how big. It was about the size of a dime. I said, cut it in half and test it, Kathy. And that is the stain that then had the male DNA in it mm. that was almost a full profile. So it had JonBenet Ramsey's DNA, right. probably her blood, and it had male DNA. It was not sperm, because you can mm -hmm. tell sperm, but male, you can tell DNA that isn't sperm, saliva, blood, hair, uh, based on the Y chromosome test. So that was done, and it was male. And so I spent the rest of the 18 months, and months after that, and years after that, trying to figure out whose DNA this is. Because remember, it's in this little girl's panties. Right. Crucial. Yeah. It is an intimate, what we call an intimate sample. Mm. It, you know, in a rape kit, when you do a rape examination, you take evidence out of, off the victim's body and from inside the victim's body. Those are intimate samples. Mm. This was an intimate sample. It was in her panties. And so um, I spent the rest of the time trying to figure out whose DNA this was. Uh, we ran, we had a database of almost anybody that had anything to do with the case that would give us their DNA. Uh, we had their DNA. There was one individual that was reluctant to give us their DNA. Well, we'd serve him with a grand jury subpoena, show up and give us your DNA. And he gave us his DNA. So we had all of the suspects, all of the family members. We had uh, people that were married into the family. We had, you know, anybody that we could possibly imagine who could have left this DNA. We had, and we knew about, we got their DNA and we had it. And it didn't match anybody. What we were lucky enough that it was a partial profile but it was enough of a profile that it could be entered into the CODIS database. Mm -hmm. Your listeners probably know what that is, yes. but that's the national DNA database that ties cases together. Even though you might not know who did it, you may have eight rapes where DNA was left. It's the same DNA. It will tie them together and it does it nationally. And then it, it, then it connects you with convicted felons convicted people or arrestees depending on the state laws that are in the database so guys that are in prison guys that are on probation for felonies it will hook you up with those people and you know it's their dna and that's how codis works and it has been running in codis since we put it in i think it was 25 almost 30 years ago and it has never matched anybody in codis and it has never matched another case that's in CODIS. 
There are over 17 million people in wow. CODIS. I was going to ask that. And there were over a million samples mm -hmm. from crime scenes in CODIS. And it has never matched anybody in CODIS. And it continues to this day to run constantly. It's not something that you have to trigger. Mm -hmm. It runs and it's comparing all the time. So as people are being added to that database, maybe someday there will be a CODIS, what they call a CODIS hit. Now, it's possible that that DNA came from the factory where those panties were made. We talked a little bit about this earlier. You guys actually bought a sample. There was a theory. Um, Bruce Levin. Bruce Levin died of cancer a few years ago. He worked for me after, when I became the elected DA, I had to replace myself in the lineup. Mm -hmm. It was the only person I hired from outside the office and didn't bring up. We called them lateral hires. I hired Bruce because I was replacing me. And I knew how good Bruce was. Mm -hmm. And I'd worked on the Ramsey case with Bruce. Bruce was a chain-smoking uh, vegetarian. He's the only <laughs> one I've ever met. And I was a coffee drinker, but not a cigarette smoker. So we would take breaks during the grand jury. And we found a place where the cameras didn't bother us. And, and he would chain smoke and I would drink coffee and we would talk about things. And, you know, he was an incredible guy and he died of cancer, but, um, he came up with the theory that, you know, these things are, um, there is a habit that people have. These panties were made, and, and I can't remember the country in, the, in Asia, but he says, you know, and I don't know if this is true or not, but they spit a lot. Hmm. And I was like, what are you talking about, Bruce? And, and he said, what we need to do, and I think there was a detective Ron Gossage, who said, yeah, we, we've got a package of these panties. There was a name for them, and they came from a, 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 a famous New York store. I can't remember the name of the store either, Bloomingdale's or something. But mm -hmm. they were day of the week panties, and I don't remember what day they were, but they were like Tuesday or something like mm -hmm. that. But the most amazing thing about these panties were that John Benet Ramsey was too little to wear them. Really? Yeah, had she walked around in them, they would have been around her ankles yeah. the whole time. They yeah. were, um, they were for a at least teenage girl, mm -hmm. but a full grown woman who was thin and fit could put these panties on. Mm -hmm. um, but they had purchased a package of them with the idea of, okay, did the contamination come from the from the manufacturing process? And I was like, yeah, okay, come on. We'll, and they tested them. They tested uh, places where DNA would be. They tested the crotch. They tested the, the band where people would have touched them and all those. And we found DNA in these unworn, oh. out of the package uh, underwear, God. but not at the level that we found. So it was a much higher, there's more markers mm. from yeah. this sample. The sample that we had from the panties had, had nine markers, which was the minimum that you had to have to put it into CODIS. Mm. And they have now, my understanding is that they've run it with the new kits, which have about 20 to 24 markers. And so they're far more markers, but it's still only a partial profile. But, the, but CODIS is based on 13 locations originally and now it's expanded so you can search interpol and you can use some of the U european markers and there's a reason for why they they've done that um but even when you retest this dna it comes back as a mixture of john benet and an unknown male and it comes back as a partial profile for the male you know her profile because you have her dna you can subtract it out, and there is this unknown markers that come from a male. Mm. It's only a two-person mixture, as far as I know. Sometimes you can have 
three people, four people. And you can tell that by looking at the markers that you have. And so it's a two person mixture. It's about a 50, 50 mixture. It's a male. It's not sperm. Uh, it's probably saliva, but I can't tell you what it is because the forensic tests for that are not reliable. The old serology tests to tell you what it is. Um, it's not, it may be blood, but the test you would do for blood, um, the contributor of the blood is probably John Bonet Ramsey because she was bleeding very, very little bit of blood, two drops. And one of those drops has this unknown DNA in it. And the other has consistent unknown DNA in it, just not as enough. So the, 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 Unknown parts are consistent, but there just isn't enough to really draw much of a conclusion on the first stain. So that was my first day. First day. Wow. wow. Day that one. was my first day. Did you even know like how the initial investigation went with, with the Boulder police? Like, did you know how I, contaminated that got? Well, I learned about it. If it had something to do with the DNA, I learned about it quickly. Um, if it, and I kind of learned about the parts that I wasn't supposed to do by listening in the grand jury mm. and the witnesses that Mike and Bruce presented to the grand jury. So I listened to, you know, the different people that testified. And, you know, one of the interesting things about that whole process was they didn't know who we were calling the media. And uh, there was one day that we had to carry in this small monitor TV bigger than your little monitors here, but about the size of a laptop, but mm. it was an old TV. Right. Yeah. So we put it in a plastic bag, a, a hefty bag, and, and Mike and I carried it into the grand jury room. And we went in front of the media, and there were three ladies from the local news that sat on this bench every day, said hello to us, asked if, if there was anything we wanted to say. We'd say no, <laughs> and we would walk in. Mm-hmm. The next day, we read in the newspaper that we had carried in a reconstructed skull of John Bonet Ramsey. Oh, my God. That the FBI had created a model of her skull, and we had it in a box, and we had carried it in. And I was like, oh, my God. It was so far from the truth, and it it was really pretty ridiculous. And so I do remember one time sitting down with Mike, and we spent hours, you know, I would spend hours with Mike because Mike actually lived in the office. He slept in his office. He showered in the bathroom. Oh my! Um, And he lived in the office that we had. So we would get done with the day. He would start cooking his dinner. I would wait till this horrendous traffic between Denver and Boulder would kind of settle down and we would talk about stuff. And I said, you know, we should really have some fun here. I have a, uh, a Buffalo head down belongs to my father-in-law. Why don't we carry that into the grand jury room (laughs) See if it makes the, and put it in the back of the, and find out, you know, what the theory is that these, these media folks come up with, you know, and that kind of thing. (laughs) But you know, you have to have a sense of humor when you're dealing with this kind of stuff. We never did anything like that, but I said, you know, next day we'll bring in duck decoys, (laughs) you know, we'll carry them in and see what they say, you know, put them in the back. Grand jury won't see them. They will have nothing to do with that, but just see what they make up because they'd Mm -hmm. make up stuff. They would say, well, they knew we wouldn't, wouldn't counter them. So they'd say, well, so-and-so is testifying this week. Well, so-and-so had testified six months ago. Mm -hmm. This thing went on for 18 months. Um, but it was always surrounded by the media. It was always this horrendous thing. I remember one day we quit early and we were sitting in what the office and we heard all of these satellite trucks and everything just like fire up and, um, went outside. They were all gone. Columbine was happening. Oh yeah. And so they had all called and said, Hey, where's your closest satellite truck? Where's your get down there because there's kids killing kids at Columbine High School, and they just left. And they were back next time we were in session, but I kind of thought about it. You know, these folks just go from 
Yeah. Misery to misery to misery. Isn't it depressing to think about? Well, the other thing is while we were waiting for the grand jury to decide what they were going to decide, Bruce needed to get some birthday cards for his sister. And so I don't know if you know Boulder, but uh, Mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of people that wear coats and ties in Boulder. (laughs) And we were all in these dark suits and the park across the street from their justice center, they had all carved out like four feet by four feet. And uh, Bruce says, I got to walk down to the mall and get a card for my sister. And I said, I'll go with you. And Mike says, yeah, maybe grab a sandwich or something. So we all grabbed our sunglasses and we walked right through the middle of them. And not a single one of them knew who we were or even raised their heads up. We just walked right through the park, right through, you know, kind of a pathway. And it was the one time that they were so self-absorbed or absorbed in their work or whatever it was they were doing. Didn't even know. It was like we were invisible oh, wow. <laughs> and we just walked through and it was so opposite to everything else we did because mm-hmm. everything else we did, you opened your trunk, they were filming the inside of your, your trunk. trunk. They yeah. were, you know, I mean, it was, that was just the way it was. It was uncomfortable. It was, uh, very foreign to me. And the other problem with the case is that there were people that leaked information about it to these folks, the inquirer, made mm. millions of dollars Terrible. off the death of this girl. The, uh, you know, the newspapers, I used to call it, um, you know, it was, it was like, it became an industry. It did. You, you know, and, um, anytime something new or something rehashed comes up, there she is on the cover again. Oh yeah. The Inquirer or whatever the globe or whatever they're called, you know, and, there's a lot of people that have made a lot of money off this poor girl's death. And, um, I got to tell you, my daughter wrote a paper to get into college is about the difference of the way the media treated Ashley gray. It was exactly the same age. African American died in a poor neighborhood in Denver where the man was held accountable and the way they treated, you know, when, when we convicted John Morris of murdering her, There was a little picture of her up in the corner of the front page of the Rocky Mountain News. Mm -hmm. And it was the only picture of her we had. And it was off her ID that allowed her to get into the rec center swimming pool. We didn't even have a picture of her. We didn't have any video of her in a, you know, beauty contest. And she's a beautiful little girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, But she got into every college that um, my daughter submitted that paper uh, just the difference of the way the media treated the Ramsey case and how they treated the murder of this poor little African American girl. Uh, so I got to experience that and you know, it was an experience when we announced what the grand jury did, we did it out in this park. And, um, I remember we were walking back and these cameramen were running ahead of us backwards. Yeah. And one of them fell over. And Alex Hunter went to help him up. And I'm convinced the others would have just trampled him. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was, it was out of control. It yeah. was uh, strange. It is nothing I've ever experienced before, you know, and I've been there when we had verdicts where Denver Broncos were murdered. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did it in a contained controlled way and had a room where the media was there. And this was just wide open and wild. Will you explain the results of the the grand jury? Because there's a lot of confusion around why Alex Hunter did not move forward with the indictment against the Ramses. Well, the fact that you know what the grand jury did, I think was a violation of Colorado law, but a judge ruled that the grand juries, what a grand jury does is it comes back with what's called a true bill. And a true bill is basically we find that, and the, and the, the DA, the prosecutor is advising that they're the advisor of the grand jury. These would be the appropriate charges. If you find this, this would be the appropriate thing. If you do this, that kind of thing, if they ask you, you advise them, but they come back with a true bill and a true bill basically says what they believe there is probable cause for the crimes that occurred. So 
Probable cause is the lowest standard in the criminal justice system. We usually do a preliminary hearing. You put on one witness. The witness tells the judge everything about the case, and the judge binds it over finding probable cause. You don't put on any other witnesses, no eyewitnesses, no physical evidence. It's just kind of a cursory review of the case with one piece of direct evidence, and the judge finds probable cause. Well, you got a long way to go between probable cause and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So what the DA then has to decide in order for it to become an indictment is, are we at that probable cause standard or are we at the beyond a reasonable doubt standard? They always say, well, you know, Grant, you could get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. Yeah. But can you convict the ham sandwich? Hmm. You know, yeah. Cause you know, why indict somebody when you don't have a reasonable likelihood of conviction? Is that just out of fear of losing though? No. Okay. No, it's ethically your responsibility as a prosecutor. The fear of losing is a completely different thing, you know, and it might make you work harder and it might make you look for evidence that you might not look for. And, you know, but losing is something that happens to any good prosecutor that tries hard cases. Anybody that ever told me they didn't lose a case, I'd look at the level, I'd look at the cases they tried. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I've lost cases. You know, I'll never forget standing up and turning to a Lamar Sims, who was my co-counsel, and said, God, I never thought I'd know what it felt like to lose a triple homicide. And he said, well, I know what it's like to lose a quadruple homicide. Because hmm. he had tried James King for the United Way, United Bank killing. So uh, losing, fear of losing is not, you know, not really a thing that I'd always tell my prosecutors this jury came back, not guilty. Did you do the best you could? Did you try the best case you could try? Did you put on the evidence that you had? Cause guess what? Prosecutors don't find people guilty. Juries do. And juries are made up of 12 people. I've heard people say that aren't smart enough to get off jury duty. Um, but I don't agree with that, but there's a lot of jokes about jurors. There's a lot of jokes about lawyers. My job was to present the best case I could present to try to prove the elements of the crime. If somebody on that jury didn't think I did it, they're the ones that find people guilty and not guilty. Same thing with sentencing. You know, I'd have these young lawyers come back and say, Hey, you know, judge gave him a crummy sentence and you know, the family was upset. It's like, did you do the best you could as far as the argument? Did you let the victims talk? We don't sentence people. This is a system that's made up of different parts. And our part is to bring the charges to try to prove them beyond a reasonable doubt. And you lose sometimes, but you don't ever file a case, not file a case based on, fear of losing. The ethical standard is a reasonable likely of conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you don't have that, if you have foreign male DNA mixed with the murdered victims in her panties, and you can't answer that question, guess what that question is? That's reasonable doubt mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. And so my advice to Alex Hunter was, you cannot sign this indictment. You cannot indict these two people until you know whose DNA this is and it can be explained because that might be your killer. And these people may very well be innocent. And the other thing that I always thought, and I think most prosecutors believe, it's the last thing in the world you want to do is convict an innocent person of something they didn't do. Of course, yeah. And you can do that. Mm -hmm. And you guys have probably done shows on, on it, and it happens in our system. The good news, it doesn't happen a lot. And you can usually sort that out. But, um, you know, that's the last thing. That's, that's what would keep you up at night. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you say to the people that argue 
because the, the charges that were being, I guess, suggested wasn't necessarily homicide charges against the Ramseys, but rather people felt like if we can't figure out who actually murdered John Bonet, there's enough circumstantial evidence. I think there's more than that to suggest that John Bonet's parents were involved in a cover up or something that something that occurred. They, somebody should be held responsible in some way, shape, or form versus absolutely nobody taking responsibility for what happened to her. What do you say to those people who are like, why not I go feel that, that frustration? Why not at least hold somebody responsible, even for child abuse or neglect or whatever it may be? Well, that's what rather the grand, than nothing. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that, that's what the grand jury wanted to do is find them guilty of child abuse resulting in death. And if you are in a position of trust like a parent, and the reason this law was passed and the reason it, it is like this is what we used to have happen is that you'd have someone in a hotel room, say, and the boyfriend is beating this baby in a bathroom and the wife is in there or the girlfriend is in the room knowing what's happening to this child. And I have seen cases where this kind of torture goes on for days. And the mother does nothing, primarily because she's afraid of the guy just as bad, but she's watching right. this and she's got a position of trust on this child. And what we used to do when we would charge them, guess what the guy would say? She killed him. Yeah. And he'd, and she'd say, he killed him. And they point at each other. So what Colorado did under the law was past child abuse resulting in death, position of trust. You had a responsibility to your child to do something if something like that was going on. And that's what the jury considered. They could not say, okay, uh, John Ramsey killed this baby, uh, this little girl. Uh, they did it together. They did it because it doesn't matter. If, uh, Patsy Ramsey knew this was going on. She had a responsibility to do something about it. And if she didn't, she's guilty and he's guilty, but that does not include a third party. So I don't know if your question is, should they have been charged with, uh, accessory or something along those lines? Um, you know, it, again, you have the same issue, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you have this foreign DNA. You either have an intruder in this house that killed this girl, or you have somebody in the house responsible for her death. Now, if they were in a position of trust, the only other person in the house would have been her brother and he wouldn't have qualified for a position of trust. He wasn't a parent. Mm -hmm. So there is a different standard if you're a parent or if you're a doctor or those kinds of things. But in that situation, that's what they considered. That's where they, they felt there was probable cause for that. It just, you know, one theory is this, one theory is this. And the, the, the evidence broke out in a way that it's either an intruder did this or someone in the house did it. And the grand jury felt there was probable cause that the parents were at least responsible in that they didn't do anything to help. And there was, you know, there was evidence that supported that, but you had this, you know. So you feel like that foreign DNA kind of overruled the other evidence then? Is well, that kind of the way me, you look? Well, let me, you know, you have the sole burden of proving everything in the case. You have to prove the elements. You have to prove everything beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense can sit there and do nothing. Now, they never do, but they could. It's all on you to prove. And you have this, if I'm defending the, them charged with this, it's like, you know full well who did this. We don't know who it is, but he left his mark. He left his call and he left his biological evidence. That's your killer. And there's always that there until that question is answered. And I felt it was strong enough based on where it was, what it was mixed with. You know, this little girl was not bleeding upstairs where she got hit in the head probably. She's bleeding down in this basement, in this closet, 
that she has been penetrated by a foreign object that caused her to bleed. So you have, if that DNA was put down at the same time, that's your killer. And I could guarantee you, I could make an argument that one of 12 jurors would have said, yep. And I believe under the standard that we have as prosecutors, you don't bring a charge unless you think there's a, you can, you don't ever say absolutely a conviction, a reasonable likelihood of conviction. And with this DNA, where it was, how we found it, I felt that, that, and I told you guys this story earlier. There was a group of elected DAs. We sat in a conference room. We laid everything out for them. And we went around the table. And I think there were five of them in the, from the metro area. And every single one of them agreed with us except one. And he said, you can never look at a case this closely and not have an arrow pointing the other direction. This is just one of those arrows. Indict him. Hmm. And I looked him in the eye and said, did you not listen to a word I said? This is foreign male DNA mixed with the girl's blood in her panties. After she's been penetrated by this broken paintbrush. This isn't an arrow pointing the other direction. This is a javelin through the heart of anybody that tries this case with a standard like a reasonable likelihood of conviction. I, for one, don't try people where I don't believe there's a reasonable likelihood of conviction. So you better saddle up one of your boys to go in and try this thing if they get indicted because I'm out of here. I'm done. Hmm. Because I believe in DNA. I know what it does. It exonerates innocent people. It helps us catch serial murderers and rapists. And you've got to live with it. If it tells you one thing, you've got to live with it. If it's something you don't like, it doesn't matter. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about this. But I, for one, believed like the grand jury that God, I, you know, years later interviewed. He said, I fully believe there was probable cause. I don't believe you could convict them. I don't believe you could prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. Could the Ramseys have even been tried in Boulder County, you think? Are they even Where were they going to be tried? Yeah. I mean, I found out about the Ramsey case. I was in Hawaii, and a cab driver said, oh, John Benet, yeah. you know? I was like, mm-hmm. what are you talking about? I mean, you know. Anywhere that, you go. Yeah. That's why the Inquirer made the millions that they made. That's why yeah. they still make TV shows about this. That's why I still get uh, an occasional text from my investigative reporter that tries to get me to talk about things about this. And, you know, I probably told you more than I've told her, but I don't ever talk about things that happened in the grand jury because that would be a violation of Colorado law. But anything that's out there in the media that's, you know, I talk about it. I don't ever express my personal opinions about this case. All I can tell you is that professionally I believe there was not a reasonable likelihood of conviction of anyone until you answer the DNA question. Because if you answer it, like many of these cases where people have waited 50, 40 yeah. years, and you go talk to the guy, he's like, yeah, I was kind of waiting until you knocked on my door. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I felt bad about killing that little girl. Do you think, and that happens. Do you think one day it could happen? This is what I think with the advancements in DNA. And I actually have talked to a group. It was a, you know, it was during COVID. So it was a group of, I don't even know, you know, you couldn't look them in the eye. It was a zoom call and the FBI was on it. I was on it. My partner was on it. I forget who else was on it. And we, we talked about potentially approaching this with investigative genetic genealogy. And there are some obstacles to doing that. And I know there's been a call for people and people that don't really know the case that, um, oh, I could solve it in a day if you just give it to me for genetic genealogy. Um, they, they don't seem to understand there's a 50-50 mixture here and there's a limited amount of DNA in any forensic case. 
And what I always tell investigators that call me is you've got a limited resource here. It's not like you can go back to a patient and draw some more blood. This is it. Right. I got a case right now where it's it. If we waste it, this woman that got murdered in her home, there may never be an answer for that family because we wasted it trying to sequence it when we weren't successful. And the other thing is I'm not much of a fortune teller, so I can't tell you in five years what they're going to be doing. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I never saw this connection of DNA and genealogy together, but I believe it. I know it works and we've solved cases and given victims answers. So the worst thing happens when you call those guys that have that cold case out of Littleton, that people have been waiting for answers and they say, Mitch, you know, we used the DNA up. You can't use it for what you're doing now because we don't have any more of it. So there's that factor. And there's also a factor that every process where DNA is involved, there are limitations. The original limitations with this was you needed a lot more than eight cells. You need a lot more DNA for sequencing and that you didn't, couldn't sort out mixtures. There will be a time we will be able to. Mm. So will anybody ever be charged? I can't tell you that, but I firmly believe we will get to the bottom of the DNA. And you know, her samples being preserved and Oh yeah. Is in good hands. It's not. Yeah. Sometimes they disappear in certain well, yeah, and certain I, cases. You know, yeah. we, we did the 63 case where Peggy Beck was murdered up outside of Decker's in a Girl Scout camp. And they did everything in the 60s that they did. They swabbed her like a rape kit. Um, they took fingernail clippings because they firmly believed that she had fought for her life and that she had scratched this man in the face. They even had suspects that had scratches on their faces that they interviewed, that type of thing. But what happened, you look at the package for the fingernail clippings sent to the FBI. Now you have the package. They sent back the package Mm. with the cotton swabs, same thing, sent to the FBI. Because remember, you know, in the 60s, there were things the FBI did that the local crime labs couldn't do, the state crime labs didn't do. None of that evidence was ever found. But Peggy Beck was raped and murdered in her sleeping bag. And they kept her sleeping bag. And we found sperm on her sleeping bag in a stain. Partially hers, but mostly his. And we were able to solve that 1963 case because somebody kept the sleeping bag. So yeah, evidence goes missing. And sometimes evidence isn't collected. Um, but, uh, that evidence in that case, unless it was contaminated before it was collected, which is always a possibility, um, or contaminated while it was collected, say at the autopsy, um, it is what it is and it's available for testing and further work can be done on it. As far as I know, because I did tell Kathy save half of it. And I think that half's still there as far as that stain is concerned. Wow. Uh, That's good to hear because sometimes you just wonder like, is it still going to be there? And because it's like, if we have it now, why not at least try it now? Because what if it degrades or disappears or something down the road? If we kind of play this like, well, it'll get better and the technology get better in the future. But is that sort of a gamble that it may or may not be there or be testable at that point down the road? Yeah. And I I take into account when I say something five years from now that that stuff's going to be preserved the way it is. Right. You know, it's going to be, it is preserved. Otherwise you would go ahead and if you were worried about it, you'd test it with our current technology. It depends. You know, why, you know, you're going to strike out. Why swing? Sure. sure. You know, I mean, yeah, you want it. You want to, if you know, you're going to strike out and you know, like I say, we, we generate, we, came up with an approach that we think might work. And we talked to him. I I haven't heard back, but you know, I have talked and things change up there, but you know, it's, I think it's a good and sound approach and it may very well be that 
we get retained to do that or somebody else does and that they're successful. You know, um, we've been hired by different departments that other companies have tried this genetic genealogy on and either told them, listen, you're, I, we've had cases where they say you will never identify the donor of this blood. Or they said, you know, it's going to cost you so much more to do this. And, you know, but they didn't solve it. They gave us the case. We've solved it. We have about three or four like that, you know, and, and I would love if one of my competitors is listening and particularly one, it just their discards, call us. If this company told you no, or they told you they can't get there, call us. Because the one thing about my company is we don't give up. We don't quit. Mm. And you know, if you don't have good results from the beginning, it isn't that much effort to keep going back and looking to see if maybe today there's a better match in Jed match than there was six months ago. It doesn't cost you much to just go back and do that. And boom, look, we have a centimorgans is the measure. We have a 300 centimorgan match now. We had one department that hired us to solve a case and it takes time. We didn't have good matches and they kind of forgot about us. There was changeover, different detectives. They currently sure. have a new boss. Called them up, said we've solved it. Wow. They're like, what? What? We just turned this over to the FBI to let them work on the genealogy. Well, call them off. Go get this guy's DNA, you know? Um, and when I say we don't quit, we don't. And we don't charge more money. Uh, that's just the way we do business. Uh, some places do it based on hours and that kind of thing. We don't do it. We, we charge a flat rate and we tell them we'll keep going back and reviewing the, reviewing the different matches in these databases as long as you want us to do it. Why doesn't every department have access to this internally, though? Yeah. Is it, is it just the sheer cost of the, oh. the equipment? Or? You'd be amazed how little the cost is. Really? Um, it's gone up because large companies have gotten involved in, uh, in what, what used to be very inexpensive. I think people would be amazed. I have never charged more than $5,000 on a case. Really? Never. Wow. Never. Good for you. That's not much. No. If you think about it. Mm -mm. If you think about a task force that includes the FBI, uh, the local police, the CBI lab, all of these people on a task force, all the hours that they're getting paid to work on this major case. It's a lot more than $5,000. Yeah. And that's the most I think we've ever made on a case. And, um, you know... <laughs> We have a great partner in our business because Crime Stoppers may have a reward for five thousand dollars. They will pay us. Oh, will they? Oh, to work on the case for the law enforcement agency for no cost to the law enforcement agency. Mm -hmm. They will pay us. We solve the case. We solved the case up in Breckenridge where two hitchhikers were killed in the early eighties, and uh, the sheriff says, "Well, I need to pay you, Mr. Morrissey," and I said, "No." We've been paid, Sheriff. Uh, Crime Stoppers pay us. No, Park County needs to pay you. So I got a check from Park County. What'd they pay you? $5,000, and I donated to Crime Stoppers. Oh, oh that's cool. Because they'd already paid us. Yeah. Because you, you, know? you have volunteers working for you. So. I have some volunteers. Listen, I have no overhead. <laughs> it is a one... I mean, I do all the administrative stuff. I do all of the transporting of evidence if we have to deal with evidence. I know how to do that. I've seen it. I've done it. I've put it into court. If somebody wants to ask me about a chain of custody, I wrap the chain around their neck. I mean, I know <laughs> yeah. that mm -hmm. stuff. It's sound, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so I do that. And then my genealogist does the rest. And we have these four incredible volunteers. I have seen them where you give them a case and they come back to you at the end of the day. We've solved it. Now, it doesn't always work that way. Wow. But I do. We have a real low overhead. We don't charge a lot. 
the only thing that has started to impact what we charge is the costs of what we do are going up. So when we first did whole genome testing, the entire genome on the case up in Breckenridge, because it was a mixture and it was also um, degraded, we had to do the whole genome. That cost us $1,400. Now it costs $4,000. So you're paying wow. somebody to right. sequence the genome. And then you're getting that information back then doing the investigation. Yeah, I don't have a lab. You're not doing the lab part of it. No, I don't have a lab. Um, I have labs that I utilize to do. So it's work. the labs that actually are doing the, the genetic sequencing that's expensive. Right. And that's why mm -hmm. every police department doesn't have their own DNA sequencing lab. Well, most police departments don't even have crime labs. Yeah, that's if you true. look at If you yeah. look at Colorado, c crime labs have sprung up across the state law enforcement you see regional labs you mm -hmm. see aurora has they have a lab now for arapaho county douglas county uh adams county has a lab but but when we started all this when we started doing dna you know the oldest crime lab in the state of colorado is denver the denver crime lab really it used to be in one room down on a, in old police headquarters, wow. which is down by the Performing Arts Center. And it was sworn police officers that was, were doing the, the crime lab stuff, which now it's civilians right. that are brought in. To well, work. and it was, a, it was a detective doing ballistics, and he bought his own microscope. Wow. And it's a specialized wow. microscope where you look in two lenses and you can compare, you look in the lens and you can compare two things to see if they match. And that's how they did and that's how they still do ballistics, mm -hmm. except now it's all computerized. Right, all they do that. models. And so stuff Denver like. had the oldest crime lab, and the only crime lab in the Western United States older than the Denver crime lab was in Los Angeles. The LAPD had a crime lab. State got a crime lab, and they have, I think, three different labs across the state. They have a backlog. It takes time. All labs have a backlog. Um, and so other places have sprung up and there are now, I think there's about eight or 10 crime labs in Colorado, uh, three, four, you know, Colorado Springs has one. There's one that services up there in, uh, Fort Collins is a regional lab. So more and more of them, but it's a big investment and mm -hmm. it's really hard for just your normal, especially a medium or small department sure. to have their own crime lab. Yeah. And so when you ask, well, why don't they have this equipment? Um, well, you can't just have the equipment, you the have instruments the that run this. You got to have DNA analysts, and you have to have two pieces of in, of equipment because if one's down and getting serviced, you can't stop doing the work. So and you have, you have to have two analysts because somebody has to co-read everything that comes out of the lab. So somebody does the work, and somebody reviews the work independently and swears off on it. You know, all these labs are accredited. They ISO get certified, they, yeah. ISO accredited. They get um, audited. I mean, it's a big deal to try to run a crime lab. It's expensive to run a crime lab. And the last thing in the world you want is to run a bad crime lab. Yeah. yeah. We're getting bad results coming yeah. out of it. Yeah. Because once that happens, then you just look at the city of Houston's crime lab and they still talk about bad things that happened there in the 90s. And based on that, they probably have one of the best crime lab systems in the country. It's independent of the police department. It's supported by the city. Um, it, it, it can raise money on, uh, to, for their own, for their good, for their use. It's, it's a standalone uh, institution, and it's good. But it, it, it was born out of a disaster. Wow. <laughs> Took a while to get right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you think about companies like 23andMe and Ancestry that are using these direct-to-consumer kits to then investigate and solve massive cases? The Golden State Killer would probably be the one people are most familiar with. Well, you got to remember, there are a number of these companies out there. Yeah. Law enforcement cannot use Ancestry, cannot use 23andMe, cannot use the big ones, My Heritage. And if we could, we would solve a lot more yeah, cases. Yeah, it opened you up to a bigger Because they're pool. the big commercial databases. 
What we use are the two smallest that allow law enforcement. They're called family tree DNA and GEDmatch. GEDmatch. And GEDmatch, they're, they're the smallest. They're the only ones that let law enforcement in. So your question then is, how does somebody that did ancestry yes, get into GEDmatch? In Jed and yeah. the way they do is for free, if you have ancestry data and you want to help law enforcement solve a case, take that ancestry data and upload it for free and opt in for law enforcement. Mm-hmm. And then law enforcement can use your DNA. They never see your DNA. They never get your DNA. But what we get are what your DNA shares or is in common with the DNA of the person we're looking for. That's what we get. We don't ever get your DNA. You know, I I read these articles. Privacy though, Mitch. Well, I know. (laughs) Privacy and the slippery slope. And you're giving your government, the government's giving, you know, and and we don't get your DNA. And the nice thing, the thing I like about Jed Match and Family Tree is 100% voluntary. Yeah, that's great. You know, we're not using anybody's DNA that doesn't want it used. And there are a lot of people that that will write me because I have a website, unitedataconnect.com, and you can go on there and ask questions, and you can go on there and ask about our training courses that we have. Um, But I get a lot of questions, and it's like, how can I help? How can I help solve cases? Mm -hmm. Well, take your family tree DNA. I mean, your 23andMe all of them go now. We know in those databases that it's an ancestry kit. Oh, do you? you yeah, can see that. because well, yeah, it because it's there that is there's an A for ancestry. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so we know it's an ancestry kit, and they are somewhat different uh, the SNPs that they look at. Mm. But yeah, if people think that you know, if I do ancestry, they're going to start solving crimes. That's not true. The problem that you have with the commercial kits and their companies is they're siloed. Mm. So if I'm trying to figure out if I'm a, my grandfather was adopted and who he really, you know, and I do ancestry, I can only look at people that do ancestry. There may be the people with the answer may be in 23 and me, or they may be in my heritage. Well, the place where they're all unsiloed are family tree DNA and Jed match. And then I can decide if I want law enforcement to use that or not. And opting into that is pretty easy, right? Yeah, you hit you a just button. Just go to the website. Yep. You hit a button when you upload your DNA and you say opt in. Family tree is the opposite. You put it in and you have the option to opt out. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. So how do you guys once you find, you know, a match based on the the number of markers? Then it gets handed over to the genealogists who are looking at familial connections or. So what happens is you upload it, let's say to GEDmatch. And you get a list of people and how much they share. Now it's usually an email and it may be their real name. It may not be. Um, And it's how much they share with the sample that you're looking for. And then you take those people and you try to figure out based on how much they share, what their relationship is to the person that you're looking for. So what we're usually looking for is somebody in the third or fourth cousin range. And I don't think people realize that range is pretty big. I mean, when you, when I have these people say, well, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to get one of my family members. In right. Trouble. My brother, my, you know, yeah. somebody. And I always say, listen, do you know how many cousins you have out to the fourth cousin? Well, how many cousins do you know? Yeah. Can you count? Cause you have 800 that go out to the, on average wow. to the fourth cousin. So you may have a fourth cousin who rapes teenage girls in Cincinnati. And you've never laid eyes on him. Right. Don't even know they exist. Why wouldn't you help us? And maybe he'll come to Denver. You know, that's kind of a cheap shot. But, yeah. Yeah. you know, he don't know you either. Right. And if it's a woman, 
may very well be the victim. I think it's important for people to understand that DNA is such an important science because in cases where it plays a role in finding the person, 90% of the victims are women. And the 10% that are left, about 9.5, 9.7 are kids. So this is a science that helps us catch men that are raping and murdering the women and children in our communities. And as somebody from law enforcement, I just don't see anything more important than that. That's very important. And that's something that people need to understand. And if people want to help solve these cases, upload your DNA and opt in at GEDmatch or don't opt out at Family Tree, it won't cost you anything. And I, the other thing I'll tell you is that the genealogists do everything they can to protect anybody in their tree, in this tree they build, that's still alive. They destroy them. Remember, this is an investigative lead. All it does is gives you somebody to go get DNA from. When you get that DNA, it may exonerate that person. Or it may match the crime scene. And that's what's going to be presented in court. This is an investigative lead. It's not going to be make or break the case. It requires further investigation. Right, right. Doesn't mean you're going to go arrest somebody no, immediately. Yeah. No. And, you know, you get it down to two brothers. One of those brothers is innocent. The other, you know, is responsible. And somebody has to sort that out. And you sort that out with the old method. You sort that out with STR technology. So you have your STR profile that was done by the crime lab. You go get a bottle that has DNA on the top of the bottle where the person drank it or a straw or a cigarette butt. You pick that up from your suspect, you run it and it matches. That's, that's what's going to go into court. And maybe not even that because they're going to require you to get a sample from the guy when he gets arrested. And that can be the sample that you use. So this is an investigative lead. CODIS, a CODIS hit is an investigative lead. All it does is tell you this is the guy, but you can't use the CODIS evidence in court. You have to go get his DNA in order to use that DNA in court. That's the way CODIS was designed. Yeah, I think there's a lot. That's actually very informative because i think there's a lot of misconceptions around so dna and i know in the past it's confusing we've definitely been confused about yeah especially the commercial dna companies and mm -hmm. and i think and i think they try to confuse you as well and try to sway yeah. you one way or another you know to try to go with them because they don't share that information they're in want. business yeah. they're in business right and, you know there are, there are people out there that write articles that you know, scare to scare people. Yeah. And, you know, I always try to, when I get interviewed, try to tell them the way it is and tell them straight, tell them how it's being used, tell them what it might lead to. But, um, you know, there's people that write for different news organizations and things, and it's more sensational to try to scare people, to try to say, Oh, the government and privacy and all those things. And, you know, I, I, they're just not real life. Um, and if you tell them real life, they don't print it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and like you said, ultimately the goal is to get killers and rapists that are still free out in the public. Could You could be walking past them every day for all you know. It could be a coworker that is just, you know, skirting justice. But this is the way, the only way it seems in a lot of cases where you're able to go back and get those guys. I know like in recent years, Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, that was kind of the big one where everybody kind of first really heard about genealogy and how that's being used to uh, connect. These people have been flying under the radar for the last, you know, 30, 40 years undetected. But, you know, all the media attention that case got, do you know anything about his cousins? Hmm. No. Does, did anybody no. say, and by the way, right. you know, so and so's Joe Smith is his fourth cousin. You know, that didn't happen. Right. And uh, that case got a lot of attention. So, you know, I, 
I've seen people that have tried to take credit and say, hey, you know, I think they solved this case because of me, you know, and it's like, no, that's not how it was solved. But, you know, some people react differently to it and you have options when it comes to your DNA and you should do things. But one thing I'll tell you is you can't take all your DNA with you. You're going to leave some when you go. Yep. And uh, it may law enforcement may be looking for it to help them solve the case. But these uh, databases are run pretty well. There are some examples out there. Um, there's some conspiracy theories, mostly around the FBI and what they're doing. But you got to remember what they did is that this was wide open and the rules weren't set. And the rules are being set or are set now. And the things that may have gone on back in the early, the good old days don't go on. Right, right. Or shouldn't go on. Mm -hmm. Because what does that do? You know, if we lose the ability to use GEDmatch or to lose the ability to use Family Tree, then these families that we've gotten answers for and these families that are out there wanting answers aren't going to get them. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a great way to look at it. Yeah. We're the guardians Yeah, and we need to, you know, and I got to tell you, there's pressure to solve cases, but you have to, you have to take a pause. You have to act ethically. You've got to do it in the way that the different databases allow you to do it. If they say, no, you can't use it, then you don't use it. That's the way I see it. And you wait. Yeah. Is, is DNA kind of the, I'm trying to think like if mm -hmm. DNA were to, you know, for some reason be outlawed as a, as a method of, of, of catching a, a criminal, what else is there beyond DNA? Well, Maryland outlawed the use of familial searching. They did it really? for purely political reasons. Mm -hmm. um, the governor agreed to it because he didn't know what it was. And, uh, there was one, I've debated the guy all over the country. Um, he got it written in there. No family, you know, we're going to do this database change. We're going to start taking DNA upon arrest and no familial searching will be done. And they passed it. Wow. Not knowing what it was, um, politically, this is the way we got to give this up to get it passed. We don't know what it is. And there was a rapist out there that they would have caught had they done familial searching um, that was moving from state to state, but was in the his brother was in the Maryland CODIS database. So, you know, that's you see things like that. I, there is no state that has outlawed uh, investigative genetic genealogy. There are three that have passed laws regulating it: it's Utah, Maryland, and Montana. And, you know, legislators aren't very creative. They like to copy each other. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see other states take those statutes and say, hey, by the way, I got a bill this year that's going to regulate investigative genetic genealogy. Um, you know, we're going to license these genealogists, that kind of stuff. But, sure, sure. Which I understand to some extent. It just seems like, especially with crime rates continuing to mm -hmm. go up that we'd want to try to combat that with the most effective tools at, at our disposal, which DNA being one of them, and we could salt, get more of these dangerous criminals behind bars in a more concrete way. Well, you know, I, you know I, I've been for years asked, why don't they just take all our DNA at, at birth? Yeah. And, and one thing I will tell you in the United States, they do, uh, the guys with the white coat come in and they poke your, poke your baby's foot. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. Uh, they take it away, and they do testing for certain diseases and things. Mm -hmm. That's all regulated. They have to destroy. They it. destroy that. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah. They got to destroy it, and it's, they've been doing that for. I'm sure they did it to me back in the 1950s. They still but do it. Yeah. That's funny. They do it. We just had and a baby. It's all destroyed. And I thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people say, "Well, Mitch, doesn't it make sense?" And, and some of the people that I debate, well, we should just take everybody's DNA. Scare people, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And every now and then in an audience, I'll say, listen, if the government, government wanted your DNA, they already they would have. have yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember Seriously. the little guys in the white coats, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, but 
it makes no sense. Yeah. Because there's a limited number of people that commit these crimes. And we aren't close to getting them all into CODIS. So why would we waste our time taking DNA from everybody and spend that money? Good example is the military. The military will take a sample from you, but they will not run the DNA because that's where it costs money until you get blown up and they have to try to identify you. People always say, well, do you get to search the military DNA database? You can't. There is no such thing. What there is, is a database of biological samples that they keep and they only run the DNA when they need it, when they need to use it. I mean, you have to do cost-effective things in law enforcement. You know, you don't get a lot of CODIS hits to women, Mm. but Colorado puts women in the CODIS database. But you rarely... Women aren't serial rapists. Women aren't, they can be serial murderers, but that's also rare. rare yeah. Yeah. But yeah. They, they aren't raping the guys they're killing before they're, you know, they're not leaving their biological samples. They're probably just shooting a bunch of guys. Mm-hmm. Um, so cost effectively, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to put a whole lot of women in these databases, but they do it. Uh, so, you know, you have to kind of, Keep things in perspective. Yeah. Um, When 8% of your population commits about 100% of your violent crime, that's that's who you want to target. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes complete logical sense. The other thing, moving to talk about Katie's Law a little bit, because this kind of plays right off of that with the idea of before this law was passed, you had to wait till they were sentenced essentially to get a DNA sample from uh, a perpetrator. Yeah. You had to wait till they were convicted, convicted, Mm -hmm. convicted of a felony. And you know, I could go into the technical definitions of a conviction because it's different if there's a jury verdict and there's a plea. Sure. But in Colorado, you had to be convicted of a felony. It started out. You had to be convicted of certain types of crime, murder, rape. And then they expanded that to all felons. So we had a database of all felons and that law was passed in 2008. What about sex offenders? Do we take their DNA? Yes. Okay, good. Even misdemeanor. Good. Sex offenders. Absolutely. Yeah. And so then in 2011, we ran a bill called Katie's Law and uh, it was based on a girl that was named Katie who was murdered down in New Mexico and her mom then became an advocate for expanding as many state laws as she possibly could. Jan. Jan Sepich was mm-hmm. her name. Thank you. Um, and I met Jan and I've talked with her many, many times. She came up and testified in front of the House Committee, Judiciary Committee, and the Senate Judiciary Committee. She's very compelling. I went to Washington, D.C. with her and we talked about a federal law that would allow, that would make states in order to get certain funding, make them become Katie law. And Katie's law is different in different states. Colorado has an interesting one. You take the DNA upon arrest, but you can't put it in the database if the person doesn't get charged with a felony. Mm. California, you just take it on their arrest. So different states have different Katie's law. About half the states take DNA upon arrest. About half still are the old felon law. Sure. You all know about the Hammer murder, uh, the Bennett case in in uh, Aurora, and that can ch- that can tell you how this can just go south on you. That became a cold case, and it went for years unsolved. And the man that was responsible was sitting in the penitentiary. Almost a- almost immediately wow. after murdering that family in Aurora and murdering the victim in Jefferson County, he went in Nevada, attacked somebody with a hammer, and got convicted. And they didn't take DNA until he was eligible for parole. Wow. So, so he so many served years went by. Wow. all of those years locked down in prison. Had they taken DNA upon his conviction, they would have known that they would have, the guy. that would never wow. have been a cold case. Wow. 
So it the would never of, have been a cold case. He uh, would have gone into CODIS. There would have been a CODIS hit, and it might not have even qualified under the definition in Colorado of a cold case. So our cold case numbers would effectively be a lot smaller if this was a thing everywhere. Well, a law everywhere. I, I'll tell you, every time I see the head of the Senate at the time we passed Katie's law, I thank him for pushing so hard. Every time I see John Morris, who was our sponsor in the Senate and our sponsor, I thank them. And I thank them not because it was a big win for me. I thank them for the victims. And I wish that the state of Colorado would do a study on the impact of Katie's law Mm. on victims and how it's hard to say, you know, how many victims would there have been if this serial rapist would have still been out there and had to wait till he got convicted? Now, I did a study in Colorado where we took guys that we knew and we, we figured out we would have prevented 50, if we, 50 murders and over 100 rapes if we would have had Katie's Law at the time of their first offense. Wow. So you can do that. Chicago, Illinois, you yeah. did a study like Indeed. that. But it's pretty hard to, to do it the opposite way. Uh, you know, like this guy might have stopped right afterwards, never raped another victim. But you can go back and look at a serial rapist, look at the first time he did it, had they taken his DNA, all of the things that would have pre- been prevented. And it's, it's pretty astonishing. I believe it. We only looked at about eight guys. We we're wow. talking 50 so took a larger, over a hundred. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They were all Denver serial rapists. Wow. It'd be mind blowing. I'm sure. Yeah. So and, Katie's law is pretty controversial though. Um, the ACLU says that it tramples on citizens rights to pre- presumption of innocence. Um, I'm curious what your take on that is. Well, <laughs> I don't know how old the article you're looking at is, and the ACLU will always say things like that, Mm -hmm. but the United States Supreme Court has spoken when it comes to people's rights and an arrestee statute. It's that very Maryland statute that I told you about where they outlawed familial searching. They gave up familial searching. They passed an arrestee statute. It was declared to be unconstitutional by their Supreme Court. It went up to the call to the United States Supreme Court and they said you can take DNA upon arrest without violating people's Fourth Amendment rights. So I know the ACLU may yeah. not, they may not give up, mm-hmm. but it is an answered question. Mm-hmm. The the <laughs> the case the, the court that decides the law of the land in the United States has spoken. What if you refuse? Good response. Do they forcibly take DNA from you? Uh, refuse those to give a sample? It depends on the statute. Mm-hmm. It, it, it has to be written in statute. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm not sure, you know. Which, I mean, you we can, can... We can take a swab of your cheek or we can poke a hole in your arm. Yeah. Which would you rather have? Because one, do one or the other. I mean, you know, they can they can strap somebody down and take their Well, they DNA. do it for DUI cases, I guess, too, where they'll, they'll take your blood. If you want it. Yeah. In Colorado, yeah. you decide. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. You decide. Breath or blood, it's a choice. Well, we've been going for a long time here, but I did want to get to your book. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love for you to tell us the story that you told us before recording okay. about Dylan. Um, it was pretty interesting. Well, you know, the book is about 300 pages. Yes, it's a it's, lot more than just that. It's available on Amazon. It's called Denver District Attorney's Office, A History of Crime in the Mile High City goes from 1869 to uh, 2021. So it's a lot know, of a lot of years. It's a lot of years and a lot of people because most district attorneys, unlike me, who served 12 years, in the history of Denver, most of them served three years and went on to something else. Some of them, there's one guy in here became a senator. Um, you know, obviously Ritter was term limited, but he served almost 12 years. Uh, there was a guy named Bert Keating that served from 1967 to, um, no, no, 1948 to 1967. Wow. So think of the diff- yeah. the change in what he saw. And, 
you know, he, he was a big chain smoker. He died of cancer. I think, you know, if he's still alive, he might, other than term limits, he might've served a whole, he died in office. Wow. Um, he's in the book. So, you know, there's a lot of people in the book. We tried to then, um, each chapter is about a different district attorney. We have their bi- their biography, what they were about, you know, how they lived, how they, you know, how they lived after being the DA, and then uh, the big cases that happened that we could find information about. So you asked about Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan spent some time early in his career in Colorado. Um, he actually took advantage of. Um, there was a musician that had a, and people will remember Conley's was down on South Broadway. Yeah. Um, he stole a bunch of, of albums from him. I never knew that. And then when they went to collect them, Dylan had thrown them out the window into the alley in the back of this apartment house. I think the apartment was in Capitol Hill. And, you know, the police basically had, had him cold, but Conley was like, no. Now I, you know, this guy's worked for me, plays music for me. He doesn't, yeah. I don't want him prosecuted. Right. And so they didn't do anything, mm-hmm. but we have things that like, um, Bat Masterson's in the book and different mm-hmm. things that Bat Masterson was a gambler. Bat Masterson was a law enforcement guy. Um, he also liked to drink a bit. He womenized. So he got into some trouble. Uh, we have the trouble that he was in, um, we talk about uh, Doc Holliday's in the book. Uh, there's a lot of interesting characters in the book. Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, had some ties to Denver and Denver law enforcement and crimes. Um, the big cases that occurred around the United Bank murders, those kinds of things. Uh, so we tried to put all of that in the book, and we tried to remember these people, good or bad, there's one DA. Yeah, that, bad DA isn't. Well, there's yeah. one that got convicted of perjury. <laughs> um, you know, it was during Prohibition, gambling, all that. Uh, Wittengill was his name. He's one of the only ones that served two terms. There was only one guy that had served two terms before him. He was in the 30s. Uh, he got involved with the, this guy that um, had uh, slot machines, kind of the king of slot machines in the country, got involved and somehow and lied about it. Mm. and got convicted of perjury. And it was interesting because he still had some time as DA. They suspended him, the Colorado Supreme Court, but they then allowed him to continue as the DA until his term was up. Wow. And there was there were cases where, like, he can't prosecute. How can you prosecute How can he that? prosecute yeah. this guy for perjury <laughs> yeah. when he's a perjurer? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, there it's were people time. that were after him. But... um There's some very interesting, famous cases in the book. And I think for people that are true crime fans, it's Mm -hmm. that. It has that. But it also is historic. Yeah. And I think the other thing about it when I was writing it was that, you know, I was thinking about, well, you know, I live in this age where people rape each other, people murder each other. We have serial murderers. Well, there's in the history of Denver, that has always happened. Mm -hmm. There have been serial murderers everything pretty much everything yeah. you know guys that assault there was the capitol hill thug they called him he would go up behind women and he would hit them in the head with something like a a little bat or something like that he attacked eight different women he killed three of them. that was in the early 1900s 1901. 1901 yeah and there was a serial rapist down on market street um he would go into these they were prostitution places what mm-hmm. the, these women would be you know, doing their, their business and he would strangle them. Wow. And it was hard to say it was the exact same guy because they didn't have DNA then. Right. But we also tried to show examples of when they used fingerprints or when they started using. And obviously when you get into the DNA area around Norm Early, Bill Ritter's time, um, I am prominent in those cases because I did those DNA cases and then, you know, there's there's the whole part about, there's a chapter uh, that I'm the DA. Uh, but there's some real interesting things here. There's some of these individuals, there are entire books written about. Mm. Some of them, there are books they wrote. 
Uh, we found a couple of these guys that were authors that wrote really? books after they left. Um, judge Steele, Steele, William Steele went up from being the DA, became a judge, really was the founder of juvenile court in Denver, went to the Supreme Court. There's a number of buildings named after him because he died of a heart attack as a Supreme Court justice, you know, and did some incredible work as a, uh, as a, as a justice. But there's a whole book that he wrote that I found. Oh, so there are books about some of the cases that we have in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen entire, there's a famous poisoning case where uh, they got a doctor from back East to come. And uh, he had, this woman had, she had gotten a bottle of what she thought was alcohol from him. And uh, she drank it and died in Denver. They got him to come from back east. They charged him with first degree murder. They convicted him of first degree murder. Mm -hmm. And he committed suicide while he was waiting for his second trial because the Colorado Supreme Court had reversed it. So, oh, wow. you know, there's a lot of interesting characters. Yeah. There's one of my favorite kind of strange cases is uh, uh, they called him the Denver Spider-Man in the 1940s. Huh. He breaks into a house. Um, it's actually a guy he knew from, I think from high school. Hmm. He was kind of a homeless guy. Uh, Theodore Conley. He, so he breaks in and he decides that he would start to live in the attic. Oh, and so he God. lives in the attic of this man's house and his wife. His name was Peters. One day in 1941, uh, Peters comes in and Conley is at his refrigerator <laughs> and Conley beats him to death and kills him. Oh my God. And goes back wow. into the attic. Oh my God. And so you've got this unsolved murder. The wife never set foot in the house again. Oh, so man. the house is sitting vacant. And on occasion, the detectives that were working the case would go by the house and they see a curtain move in the house Whoa. eight months after the homicide. Now, remember, no one's in the house, so no one's bringing food into the house. Yeah. 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 Um, and Conley is getting thinner and thinner. And when they see this curtain move, they burst into the house. They see Conley going up into the area where he lived grab him by the leg, pull him down, and oh. get a confession from him that he had murdered Peters. Why was it called Spider-Man? Because he lived like a spider oh, up, I, in, okay, the, I up in the attic of his house. <laughs> wow. I don't know why they named. I don't know why the media named. It's sensationalizing. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know? And so we have the serial rapists and murderers here. Um, a lot of people that got away with a lot of crimes in this book. But it, it's an interesting book. Anybody that wants to get the book, all you have to do is go on Amazon and type in Denver District Attorney's Office. We'll yeah. link it as well for people. Yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll have it linked. And yeah, it's a great it's gift as well. It's $20. It's $20. And if anybody That's a good deal for knows me book like and I, if I'm in person, I will sign it for. I, oh. You know, I do occasionally do presentations where I go out. And people want the book, so afterwards I'll wait and stay and sign the book for them. Oh, that's so um, awesome! Will you sign ours? Sure, I'll sign it. Great. Um, I do want to mention that uh, I do have a co-author named Norm Brisson. Mm. Norm's a great guy. Um, worked in the DA's office. Always was interested in the history of the DA's office. So when I started doing these daily Facebook posts about the history of the DA, Denver DA's office. Uh, he joined me in putting together the book and he mm. played a really substantial role in writing a couple of the chapters and making sure that we had the histories and their family histories oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I've had a lot of people that, um, not because they know me because they've read it and they said, you know, I really enjoyed it. Um, retired yeah. detectives that know some of the cases, um, you know, just folks that say, yeah, I read the book. It was, it was fun. Well, we'll definitely be going through it because it sounds yeah. like there's a lot of good cases out we could cover on our on our podcasts mm -hmm. on all yeah. of them. So yeah, and we'd love to have you back if you're ever interested. Well, yeah, and, and more in depth about a specific case. 
Yeah, and love to come back and talk to you about some of our, you know, in depth about some of our successes when it comes to the yeah. investigative genetic genealogy. Mm -hmm. We've had some great successes with our familial search software in other states. It's really cool. Um, run into some obstacles in New York after they solved some, some cases there. Really, you know, cases yeah. that just little girl raped and murdered, thrown into a dumpster. They, ah, they, they use familial searching to solve it. Um, yeah. But it's just, uh, it's been good work. It matters to me. I think the reason we do it is to give these families answers. And there's always kind of a bittersweet um, when you conclude one of these cases yeah. and, you, um, and you, you think about the person that waited 30 years for an answer. Mm -hmm. You think about that father that found his daughter dead on the floor, nude, raped and murdered, and he went to his grave not knowing. And, you know, I've talked to her little sister, mm -hmm. and, she, and he said, you know, my dad was never the same. I'm talking about the, How could you be? the Sylvia Quayle case. Yeah. And I always think about it in terms of, you know, when that predator murdered that young woman, he killed two people. Yeah. You know, he really yeah. effectively ended the life of that father too, yeah. because he found his daughter in that situation. I'm sure there was some degree of, you know, I should have protected her. I should have done better. I, you know, all of those kind yeah. of things that go to, through your mind as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, you know, when you find the little sister of somebody that got murdered in 1963 or in Helen, Helen, Helena Przinsky's case, the, uncle and aunt that were basically taking care of her. She was from Boston. She was an intern. She'd been here a couple of weeks staying with her uncle and aunt. She goes missing. They find her in a field in Douglas County. I can't imagine what those people felt like for the rest of their lives. My brother entrusted me with his daughter and this happened to her on my watch. Yeah. How, how do you, you, you know, and we never watch? got a chance to talk to them. Yeah. We got a chance to talk to the sister and she, you know, there's cuts of her on tape saying that we were heroes and, and all of that. But I think about the people that would want those answers the most. And a lot of times when you solve a case from 1980, 1960, those people are gone, yeah. but it's good work. It matters. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue it. Yeah. I mean, we've covered so many, so many cold cases and, it's so important that there are people behind them that actually want to see them through, even even when it feels like there's there's nothing left or the family is gone. You know, it still matters. And yeah. So if you want to help us, like I said, put your DNA into That's right. into Jed opt Match, in. into Family Tree, opt in, mm -hmm. don't opt out yep. with Family Tree. Um, you know, Crime Stoppers is a great partner. Like I say, they give us the rewards. If you want to support them, they're a nonprofit. If you want to say, I want to donate this. I want to dedicate it to solving these kind of crimes. Don't give this money to informants. Give it to United Data Connect. Oh, you can specify that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow, really cool. And you can say, you know, I want, uh, we have a couple of uh, different organizations. Uh, there is a genealogy society down in Castle Rock. They want to donate the amount to solve a case. I talked to them and said, yeah, we're more than happy to do that, but we want to solve a Castle Rock case. Mm. So you find the case you want us to do and you're willing to fund it. We'll do it. Wow. Um, so there's people out there besides law enforcement that want to see these cases solved. They want to be part of what we're doing and we're more than happy to partner with people to try to get these cases solved, to try to get these John Doe, Jane Doe, baby does identified. Yeah. You know, when you identify, uh, we just recently within the last few days identified a baby that was found in a river out in Nebraska and we found the mother and you would think, okay, she threw the baby in the river. She should be charged with murder. She was 14. She would be treated as a juvenile. And she told the investigators that she was raped. And she told them who raped her. And we've got this baby who is the product of this sexual assault, if it happened. 
and the man was 22 years old. So if it was consensual or if it was a rape, it's sexual assault on a child. Yeah, either way. Mm -hmm. So think about it. We identify the baby, we find out about a crime, we find out about another crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hopefully that man will be held accountable for what he did to that 14-year-old girl. Yeah. We find, uh, you know, we identify the remains of an 18-year-old girl in the pine forest up here in Douglas County. Now you start the homicide investigation. Yeah, mm-hmm. wow. Because the back of her head, was she fell or she got her head caved in, somebody hit her or something. But now you know who she is. You right. can start to say, okay, mm-hmm. who was her boyfriend? What was she doing? You know, was she at a party? What was, you know, Gives you and you start step. the whole thing yeah. going. So, you know, even the Doe cases are really important to get answers for. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and there are thousands. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. thousands in Colorado. Wow. Well. And the unsolved cases, there's thousands in Colorado. Now, remember, cold cases don't always have DNA. Mm-hmm. You know, and hopefully right. something really else. Tough, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, they can be really tough. Yeah. Uh, there's ways to solve other, uh, other ways to solve cold cases. But um, if there's DNA and if you have somebody that is and you're willing to push, start making phone calls, find out what's going on with that case, make your voice heard. It's those families or those friends that sit back and don't. Helena's family and her friends would come out here on different anniversaries and they would meet with the Douglas County Sheriff and say, what's going on with this case? We are not gonna forget this girl. We went to high school with her, and now they're grandparents. Wow. They still would come out and ask, what's going on? That's amazing. How can we do this? They yeah. came to the sentencing, the friends. Really? Or they were on Zoom because it was yeah, during uh, yeah, COVID. Right, right. And he pled guilty to first degree murder, so it was a done deal as far as the sentencing, but they still Never read their statements to the court and recognized how hard Douglas County worked on this for as many years as they did. That was the early 80s. So, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could talk to you all day about yeah. this stuff. So interesting, all of it. And, you know, we'll definitely have to talk about you coming back and it'd sure. be great yeah. to partner up on a case together yeah, um, and really be. dive into it. Something. Well, if your less listeners pull together, you know, if you guys want to help us solve a case, yeah. I yeah. told you how much it costs. Yeah. Let's do um, it. We can raise five grand. Yeah. Easy. And let's do it. Let's, do it. let's find yeah. a case where we can help. That'd be great. And, let's absolutely do that. You know, if we can do that, I mean, it sounds like you've got a great audience. Oh, yeah. We've got to yeah. committed of cases. Yeah. And, you know, if they're interested in my book, all they have to do is go on Amazon, type in Denver DA. It'll come up and you'll have a link. It's a gray cover. It's got a bunch of old men on the cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you know. But yeah, we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up everything today there. Mm-hmm. We'll link everything, yes. uh, Mitch's book, mm-hmm. United Data Connect, all of his information in the description below if you're watching yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, definitely check it out, guys. The book's awesome. But yeah, thanks again, Mitch Morrissey, yeah. for joining Huge us today. This, this has was, been a real treat. It was mm-hmm. great to to kind of hear things from the other side, so to speak, you know, and, and re- I think it's, it's, I think you're going to change a lot of people's perspectives on on district attorneys and you know just mm-hmm. there's a lot of negativity often oftentimes surrounding uh district attorneys and in, in, in a lot of different cases and so i think i mean you're one of the the good ones for sure so well, yeah. if you ever watch those old perry masons it was always the same guy it was always the prosecutor and the prosecutor yeah. was a bad guy yeah you yeah. know and mm-hmm. and for years the prosecutor until law and law and order the prosecutor was always the yeah, bad guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I grew up, the prosecutor was the bad guy, you know, and my dad was a defense attorney. So, yeah. but I just want to thank you guys for having me on. I hope your audience enjoys the conversation that we've had. I think so. I, I think, think so. that if anybody has any questions about this or anything, you can go to our website. It, our website's one of those annoying ones that says, if you have a question, contact us. And, you know, it pops up every now and then. Just fill it out. I'll respond. I hope I don't get a hundred. Yeah, I was gonna now, say, but <laughs> careful you know. what you wish for, because yeah. people yeah. will will reach out. So, mm-hmm. yeah. but that's great. I, I'm, yeah. This was a very very productive conversation. I think yeah. very insightful. So, 
Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Check everything out below. But that is it for us today. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you.